up on board staff grievances and maintaining the governance position. This workshop is presented as part of the Cooperative Board Leadership Development Program, which is presented by CDS Consulting Co-op <clears throat> and is a thorough and comprehensive support package for boards of directors of retail food co-ops. It includes resources like this. It includes fabulous regional workshops for orienting new directors. It includes ongoing support for the board, which can be used in a variety of ways throughout the year. And it includes an annual retreat. If you have questions about this package, you can either contact Mark, whose email is shown at the bottom of the screen, or you can go to our web page, which is also shown at the top of the screen. This is our CBUILD team. I am Thane Joyle, and I am a board consultant for the past couple of years with the team. And I'm presenting this workshop and privileged to do so with my colleague, Carolee Coulter. And I'll introduce myself by saying that I usually work with the uh, management side of the CDS Consulting Co-op, but I always look forward to opportunities to collaborate with my CBUILD colleagues um, on issues that involve uh, staff or the general manager's relationship to the board. And I find Carolee's collaboration tremendously important and supportive because circumstances when you are a member of a cooperative board uh, can arise that make you fairly unpopular and as a board um, can subject you to really unpleasant questions in the co-op. How come you fired so-and-so? Have you ever experienced a scenario like this? It's really common, actually, um, sometime during the life of a co-op to have a personnel action uh, create a stir in the community. Oh, management says we can't talk about it people start to pick it up. Sometimes the media picks up the story. And it can happen that the conflict doesn't go away. It continues to escalate. And there's a culture that has in our uh, retail food co-op community often look to the <coughs> excuse me, board of directors to resolve these troubles. There are real problems with that. Boards of directors are intended to govern. The matter of personnel management is something they typically co-op boards delegate to professional general managers who know how to do this. Um, if board members get in the middle, not only are they outside their expertise, but they can interrupt the chain of accountability. They can interfere with the general manager's authority. Also, because boards, <coughs> forgive me, tend to be politicians, you can see a situation where the board tries to split the difference to try to make both sides happy. And meanwhile, it's completely distracted. It can't do its governance work when it is trying to pay attention to a human resource matter. So the purpose of this workshop is to answer the question in the box. How does the board express its values about staff treatment? How do we make sure that our needs are met and hold management accountable for accomplishing those values, those goals, and not get involved, not get in the middle, so that we can answer our member owners when they confront us in the aisles of the co-op with a question about a personnel matter, um, and not interfere with the co-op's operations. Looking at these kinds of questions is just like any other uh, governance question. The board does just the basics, set criteria preferably in writing, assign authority to a single place, and then check to see if your criteria are being met. For boards that use policy governance, this is easy, right? Because these are the executive limitation policies. And it's very typical to have, as in this sample policy from the CBUILD template, which is available on CBUILD's library page, a global executive constraint that requires that the general manager not cause or allow any practice, activity, decision, or circumstance that is unlawful, imprudent, or in violation of commonly accepted business and professional ethics and practices, or in violation of the cooperative principles. 
that's a good broad statement. And if you said nothing more, there's <clears throat> a very substantial argument that no reasonable interpretation of that would allow the unfair treatment of staff. But typically, you'll want to have an additional level of detail in your policies, as, for example, this sample, which specifically speaks to staff treatment and specifically provides that the general manager will not treat staff in any way that is unfair, unsafe, or unclear. And specifically, the general manager will not, and what's relevant to our work here today, provide, operate without written personnel policies that provide for fair and thorough handling of grievances. Well, by setting up that policy, the board has assigned authority to the general manager or the management group of your co-op uh, to make sure that a grievance procedure is in place. Uh, this has been uh, something that GMs have taken seriously. Many, many co-ops do have policies addressing grievance procedures, but um, we found that nevertheless in real life when uh, con conflicts have come up and boiled over, such as the one we described earlier, where say a well-known employee is involved and many of the membership gets pulled into it. Uh, so situations where the grievance procedures that have existed haven't been adequate to the task. They have not satisfied uh, so, uh, staff members, board members themselves, and uh, co-op members, and the public in general are not always satisfied that the grievance procedure uh, worked, or even uh, the grievance procedure was not used at all because it wasn't perceived to be uh, available or relevant or up to the task. So it was because of that that CBIL decided to put, uh, put together a project to explore grievances and see if we could come up with a cooperative model grievance procedure. So we had this summer, we put together the cooperative model grievance project. The goal of the project was to come up with a model procedure or potentially multiple procedures for employee grievances that can't be resolved through the ordinary informal channels that are available in the workplace. I want to stress that for a moment because the vast majority of conflicts between employees and management in a co-op are settled without a formal grievance procedure ever being involved. Very many problems are solved without ever reaching the public eye um, through the chan what we're calling the ordinary informal channels. Uh, this may involve an employee talking directly to their supervisor who then goes and talks to the general manager and they solve it, or it may involve the employee going to the human resources manager if the co-op has one. Um, often just by talking between themselves, people solve problems. But what we were looking for is a system that could handle situations where those ordinary channels don't work. And of course, we want to ensure fairness and impartiality to the employees without interfering with management's accountability to the board. So that was our goal. Uh, here, the people involved in the Cooperative Model Grievance Project, the task force, we had, uh, there were seven of us, including two human resources managers, uh, the general manager of a small co-op, a uh, uh, board vice president, and two non-management employees, both of whom are on um, staff elected bodies within their own co-ops and therefore were speaking not only for themselves, although their personal perspectives were valuable, but also could involve input of other staff. The uh, seven of us, through a series of conference calls and readings and a blog, uh, were able to come up with a model pr procedure, which we all found consensus on actually quite readily. Uh, and then we ran our first draft by 12 co-op human resource managers, five GMs, a board president, and three other consultants. Uh, they, um, we actually offered more the opportunity, but these were the ones who responded. They gave us very thoughtful feedback that caused us to uh, rework our, uh, our proposal and develop more materials. Can we see the next slide? Um, we had some cert a certain criteria in deciding what our model would, you know, in choosing our model. Um, we wanted to 
have a means that um, would be available to all employees and would be user friendly enough that employees would use it instead of trying to make end runs around it by going to the board without having dealt with the, grie you know, the grievance of management. We wanted to provide a credible endpoint to conflicts where at, we could say at last it's finally come to an end. We've had a final binding decision. And as you see, our last criterion, w it would not involve the board of directors in any grievance, but allow the general manager to report to the board that there was a fair and thorough process in place. The member of our task force, who is a board member, was the most adamant about making sure that the board did not end up being the court of last resort, because he was the one who kept reminding us that it would cause board members to have to deal with areas with which they were unfamiliar. It would take, pull them off their agenda and so forth. But we all did uh, find agreement on all of these criteria. Uh, we came up in, with our model. It has certain core elements. I'm not going to go into each of these in detail because these are, as you will see, available. Uh, m m uh, quite a few materials about the Grievance Project are available in the Seabuild Library. But a uh, couple things I want to point out here. We, um, uh, we're, we wanted to make sure that there was a good intake channel for grievances so that employees would actually uh, would have some help in navigating the procedure and therefore would actually use it. Uh, we went for a sort of jury duty model of a grievance committee, although we also provided another alternative that would use an outside arbitrator instead of an internal grievance committee. Um, we looked uh, and we very much advocated offering professional mediation for terms of separation for terminated employees. In many cases, uh, when an employee is terminated, they're in shock. They walk out of the meeting without having grasped everything that happened. They want to be able to talk about it more. Having a mediator there who's a professional third party outside of the co-op can allow employees to say their piece, or the, the ex-employee to say what they need to say and feel heard. Uh, to uh, go over what their benefits are going to be uh, and to negotiate the terms of their separation. For example, they may wish to discuss what sort of reference they will get. They may want to talk about uh, what will be said about their leaving, whether it will be presented as a, a what do you call it, a resignation instead of a termination, and so on. We felt that that could be a very a valuable a, um, you know, a tool within the toolkit for grievances. We were quite clear that harassment and discrimination claims, because they involve legal issues, need to be handled by a, se a separate procedure. And we came up with flow charts that showed how that parallel grievance procedure and where it intersected with it. We thought there should be a statute of limitations for filing a grievance. And finally, we thought it was very important to have a provision for each grievance to be evaluated but um, after it was over. So many materials are available on the Seabill Library. Uh, there, we have instructions to a grievance committee that are very detailed. We have model personnel policies, a grievance filing form, confidential, confidentiality agreement forms, um, a grievance evaluation form, and also a sample monitoring report that a general manager might write to a board uh, for monitoring the staff treatment policy about grievances. We want to stress that we regard this as a work in progress, not a finished, done deal. And we, at the bottom of all of our documents, we give a, an email for contact and request feedback from users. So we're hoping that as managers experiment with our grievance tools, they will give us feedback and we will be able to refine them so that they will work better and better. So the governance question then is how do we be sure that the criteria we set for handling staff grievances are being implemented? How do we know that the values that we have written down are actually being put into effect? And the answer is we check. Because of course we're not going to be there when any of this is happening. It's just like any other 
circumstance at the co-op that we're trying to control through governance. We monitor. And if you're using policy governance, then you're monitoring in a very formal way. Um, and you would expect a monitoring report that would look something like this, uh, these five items on the screen. You'd expect to see a monitoring report from your general manager telling you that there are appropriate policies and procedures. And not just telling you, but showing you. Because remember, monitoring isn't just a matter of because I said so, but actually boards need to insist that there's data to support the assertions in the monitoring report. So we would expect a board to see uh, copies of the policies and procedures that the general manager is using attached to this monitoring report, not for the board to approve, but simply as evidence that the policy is being implemented. So the board would want to read them, certainly, and make sure that the values that they've established in policy are mirrored or reflected in those um, manuals, but not for approval. And remember, too, that a reasonable interpretation is what the board is looking for. It doesn't mean that you agree with the stuff in the personnel manual. It just means that it looks like a reasonable interpretation of your policy, which requires fair treatment of staff, and in this case, uh, fair and thorough handling of grievances. You would expect your monitoring to tell you, for example, that supervisors are trained to make sure that the policies and procedures are effectively carried out, and perhaps you might see a training schedule um, and you know logs showing who had been trained when. You would expect to have a statement telling you that the staff's perception um, about the clarity and appropriateness of the grievance procedures meets or exceeds some established benchmarks. Perhaps this would be uh, supported by survey results, for example, um, and you know some documentation of what those benchmarks are. Actual grievances you would expect to be reviewed on completion by a third party expert to make sure that they followed the procedure in the grievance policy. And you would expect to see a report from that third party expert. And finally, um, the manager would require participants in the grievance committee and the employees, the people involved in the process, to complete an internal evaluation after every grievance. So it's important to note that a key piece here is if there has been a grievance, after each grievance procedure concludes, so contemporaneous, uh, we're looking for an internal evaluation. Ask the people participating to fill out a questionnaire so that the procedure can be refined if it needs to. Nothing's necessarily perfect the first couple times around. But the idea is we're trying to get to something that is reliable. Second. Also, um, Spain, can I add something here? Um, also, the evaluation can show whether the employees involved in it thought that the procedure was fair and thorough. which is important. Perception is everything. And, and particularly in terms of uh, bringing an end to a matter in the community, it seems to me that this internal evaluation is going to be especially important for the board to be able to look at and say uh, with confidence that its policies are being carried out. But the other component here that's important is an external evaluation to ask an outside expert to look at the system once every three to five years, um, or after there's been a very contentious grievance, just to make sure that the procedure is functioning as intended by the board. But what if there haven't been any grievances? Then how do we monitor it? Well, the first three data sets are still available still have the policies and procedures and can check to make sure that they're there. You still want to be sure that supervisors are trained and that the staff's perception about the clarity and the availability and appropriateness of that grievance procedure uh, is in place. Um, so if there aren't any grievances, it does not mean that you can't monitor it. It just means that you have less data to work with. How does a monitoring report, when would a board expect to see a monitoring report on this portion of the staff treatment policy? We would expect the board to be monitoring it regularly. Um, typically, you'd go past it at least once or twice annually. But 
there typically is also a policy for those boards using policy governance uh, in the communication and support to the board section of the board policy manual that requires the board to be informed of a non-compliance issue, for example. So that one of these monitoring reports could come up in that context. Um, finally, the board, of course, can monitor any policy by any means at any time. So following a very public or very contentious grievance, um, it might be appropriate for the board to schedule an additional monitoring of this policy just to bring everybody up to speed and uh, bring the matter to closure. So, Carolee, if you encounter this situation where somebody popular is fired and everybody is talking in the back room, then what do directors do when someone stops them at a community event and says, hey, do you know about this? Well, I think that directors can have um, so certain things they can say whether it is to an individual member who calls them at home, an employee who stops them in the aisle when they're shopping, or a question from the floor at an annual membership meeting. And I think these are the key points that a director should be able to say with confidence. Uh, we have a process in place for the employee to use. We have confidence in the fairness and thoroughness of this process. And we can have confidence because we've had it evaluated by experts in the field and it's uh, because it's based on the best practices of other co-ops. In any case, we have confidence in it. We check regularly to make sure it's working. And we have various data to by which we check, which we've been over. But one of those that I think is particularly important to show uh, how effective your checking is to say that we do have employee surveys, so we know how employees see the grievance procedure, and we have internal and external evaluations of grievances. Then, of course, it's important to say we can't discuss the particulars of a disciplinary action because we need to respect the privacy of the employee. Also, uh, there are uh, further problems you can get into when you start talking um, too much about the details of a disciplinary action in public. Um, but I think it's important to say it's not that we're hiding anything, but we are protecting the privacy of the employee. And so it comes back around to this. We have confidence that our grievance procedure is fair and thorough, and if anyone feels unfairly treated, we want them to use it. Now, one of the implications of this is that the, we, we, we're thinking, and this is something that the Cooperative Model Grievance Task Force did all agree on, is we think the grievance procedure should be available for employees who have been terminated. That turned out to be extremely controversial when we circulated our first draft among co-op managers. Um, and we have provided in our models, we have alternatives that would not necessarily result in a manager's decision getting overturned with the fired employee being reinstated and the manager feeling that they've been undercut and, the, and all that. Uh, we think that there are some alternatives, such as having an outside arbitrator who can give an award to the employee if they think that management has um, acted in the wrong. Um, there's, there's a number of tools we could use there. But we do think that providing a way for terminated, terminated employees with a statute of limitations, they can't go on for days, you know, weeks and months and then come back with a grievance. But we think that there could be something made available there that that would actually be an effective way of dealing with these conflicts that get blown up and start involving other parts of the community. That said, though, a grievance procedure can work for situations short of termination and it, it's a very important tool, and even if it's about an employee who's still there at the co-op and there's rumors spreading around and people confront directors, these same points directors can make. So, Carolee, what if the, the allegations, the complaints are really, really bad? I mean, what if 
you know, someone calls me at home to tell me that, you know, the general manager is engaging in conduct that is, you know, amounts to abusive behavior and is silencing employees with threats so that no one will talk. So it's really bad. That has so happened. <laughs> that those things have happened. Allegations have been made that uh, the general manager is harassing somebody or the general manager has embezzled or is drinking on the job or, or you know, very serious implications. Well, in that case, uh, I think first of all, what boards have to do, if, some, if an employee comes to the board with uh, an allegation like that, is to consider the severity of the situation, what the implications are, if it's true, and what the trends are. Do they get one isolated complaint? You know, we consider, you know, we're getting one isolated complaint from somebody who's not necessarily in a position to know, and we don't, or are we getting, um, you know, a, a series of complaints like this from different sources? Again, it would depend on the severity. Uh, because there are certain issues somebody could bring up, even if they're the lone voice in the wilderness, it still needs further investigation. So you have to consider all of these things together, the severity, the implications, and the trends. Now, remember that the board can monitor any policy at any point by any means. So one of the tools available to a, a board in this situation is to hire an investigation. By, or you know, contract with a qualified third party to conduct an investigation to get the facts. Um, in this case, um, the, the outside investigator, um, who may be the co-op's attorney or somebody from the attorney's office, or it may be someone they recommend, or it may be someone else known in the community who has no contacts with the co-op and therefore has no conflicts of interest, um, to have a third party investigate, find out the facts, and deliver a report, uh, then the board can satisfy itself as to whether these allegations uh, are true or at least that there's enough information to indicate that they need to consider it further. Sometimes what, uh, in, and in the situations I'm thinking of, real life situations, there were investigations. Investigations, uh, for example, in one case where they came back, they showed that the allegations were baseless. The board then could be satisfied with that. In another case, the, uh, the report came back saying there is nothing um, that if there, there's been no violation of the law here. However, there's obviously some very raw feelings, and management is going to want to take some action to ad to address those for workplace morale. Um, if an invest and I don't happen to know of an investigation that came back saying, yes, these things are true, but if, if the board got that, they would then have the data by which they could decide, decide, if necessary, to discipline or terminate the general manager. The point is, don't rely on anecdotal evidence. Don't get thrown off your agenda as a board by rumors, but you can get um, uh, facts on the rumors by bringing in a professional investigation. It's a really good point, Carolee, because those rumors can be pervasive. And I think what's alarming is when they seem to come from many sources, and it can take a board a little bit of time to figure out the source of those rumors and whether it is just a single, for example, uh, concerned employee or whether it's many. One thing I'd like to say here is that we've been talking in terms of policy governance for co-ops that are using that system. Well, we do think that policy governance provides uh, the best tools for a board to deal with staff grievances and allegations of misconduct. But it is completely possible for a co-op that doesn't use policy governance to still follow the uh, advice that we're giving here. It's still possible to set a policy on grievances, to, to instruct the general manager that uh, the board wants to know that there is a fair and thorough grievance procedure in place and that the board wants some kind of data from the general manager to show that that's so. And the board can ask for reports after grievances that have high profiles that are contentious and the board knows about them. The board can always ask for that. And 
of the board can um, can order uh, investigations into allegations of misconduct. This is all all available to all boards, whether they follow policy governance or not. But we do think that policy governance sets up a structure that will provide some of the most regular and the smoothest uh, functioning of systems for setting criteria, um, assigning authority, and checking to see if it's done. One of the reasons policy governance is particularly assuring is because it insists on written policies. And so for a co-op that isn't using policy governance, I do think this is one of those circumstances where an explicit written delegation of authority to the general manager uh, provides good protection to the co-op. It's a good practice. Carolee, before we sum up and conclude, do we want to uh, see if there are some questions, or shall we go ahead and um, offer some final thoughts? Well, well, <coughs> well, let's see if there's any questions. Joel, perhaps you're on mute. Hmm. I'm looking for some questions. Well, I know uh, one that is Joel with us. Uh, yes. check, checking. Oh, good. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, there are some questions, uh, some of which you covered already in the presentation, but um, you know, you talked a bit about outside resources, mediation, uh, investigation. And, uh, how can a board determine when professional outside mediation or, you know, an investigator uh, is required? Well, I'll take that. Um, I think that a board would not uh, ordinarily be involved in deciding whether there's going to be a professional mediator for employees that they would delegate to the general manager to set up a grievance procedure that would allow the tool of mediation to be used. Uh, and our cooperative model grievance procedure, the different versions of that model do offer some uh, guidelines for how a manager might use a mediator. Um, but for an, an outside investigator into the conduct of the general manager, the board is the supervisor of the general manager. And the board is empowered, I believe, at any time to satisfy itself that the general manager is, doing the, is performing the job to their satisfaction. So I believe that the board um, is hearing rumors and they aren't sure if they're factually true that that would be a good time for them to hire an outside investigator. If the board hears rumors, confronts the general manager, and the general manager confesses, yes, they've done something or other, then the board doesn't need an investigation. Uh, I don't actually, I can't think of a scenario where that I know of where that's actually happened, but I think it's you know, possible to imagine it. Um, but for, as for whether a board would want to tell a general manager to use mediation, the tricky part with that is that um, if the, board is, the board is the supervisor of the general manager, and that's their only employee. The general manager is the supervisor of the other employees at the co-op. The general manager could decide to use mediation, and I know some who have, who wanted a mediation with between them and one of the people they reported to. This could be in the context of a grievance or not, because they felt that they couldn't communicate effectively with this man, with, let's say it's um, their right-hand person, or a uh, store manager, financial manager, let's say, they felt they couldn't communicate effectively with this manager, and they felt like they weren't getting through, they weren't being heard, and they were w wanted to try mediation as a tool to improve communication. I could see in that case that the, the general manager could choose that, but I think it would be wrong for the board to dictate it. For example, if that financial manager came to the board and complained, the general manager is such a tyrant, the general manager is incompetent, um, that the board would um, want to say to that person, you know, you, 
you need to take this up with the general manager. We're not going to mediate between the two of you. One of the things that you have to be careful of with mediation is that for mediation to be truly effective, both parties have to be willing and both parties have to be, um, let's see, they are going to come up with their own agreement. Nobody's going to enforce it outside of them. That's how mediation works. An outside person who does not have the power to compel the, the conflicting parties facilitates their communication so that they can come up with agreements that they can then abide by in order to have an ongoing working relationship. Uh, and so this is a kind of, uh, say, a, it's a prescription that the board shouldn't be uh, using to tell the general manager to, you know, the, the, the board, I don't think the board would want to tell the general manager to have a mediation with one of the people that they're, they supervise. But I do think that general managers can decide to include mediation as part of the, as one of the tools for handling grievances. And the difference is the willingness, you know, the the willingness to engage in mediation. If a GM thinks this is a good idea and they want to do it, it's probably going to work, or at least it's going to, at least it's got a 50% chance of working because one party to the mediation is willing to do it. So I would say the board should stay out of that, out of mediation. Right. There's an, we have another question which is probably relevant to pretty much every board, um, and that is, how do we handle a member complaint, um, or is there a way that, uh, can, can the procedure that you're describing be applied equally to a member complaint as with the staff or general manager agreements? Do you want to take that, Thane, or do you want me to take it? Yeah. I think um, the process for handling the Member complaint is uh, similar but separate, um, but the same principles apply. Um, you know, typically boards have policies on uh, treatment of customers, members, owners, um, and other people with relationship to the co-op, and it's important that there be procedures in place for those complaints to be heard and responded to effectively, and the board wants to establish those policies and check to make sure that they're being upheld. So those principles continue to apply. Um, the other piece that applies is uh, the, you know, sort of the discretion. And since we have the, um, this concluding slide up, I just want to point out that one of the most important positions for boards to remember to do is to support your general manager. In general, you know, things like a, a member complaint is usually about an issue that you have delegated to your general manager and whatever is going on, certainly the board um, knows what it's spoken to in policy but doesn't know the specifics of the situation. And so um, it's really uh, the position of strength is not to get involved. Um, at the same time, that means the board has to hold its manager accountable and be checking that its policies are being met so that it can say with confidence that we have policies in place that would not allow anybody to be treated inappropriately, and we check regularly so we know that those policies are being upheld. Carolee, I have a who decides question that uh, came up today when I was speaking to a, a couple board members who had actually gone through a grievance process with their board, and in reviewing the uh, personnel policy their manager put together afterward, um, they were not happy with it because it was their feeling that the general manager had basically made uh, herself the, you know, the court of last resort. There was a grievance committee, but it made a recommendation to the general manager, and the general manager uh, made the final decision. Now, I just wondered if you could speak to um, how that works in the model that you yes. guys have developed. It is one of the models, one of the versions of the model that uh, we provided, because, and it was in response to the feedback from general managers uh, who, I would say, on the whole, they tend to want that, mo that version of the model. They want to be able to be the court of last resort. They want to make the final decision. And 
I understand why they want to do that. Um, now, in one of the versions of the model we have is that the general manager makes the final decision um, in cases where, uh, let's see, they can make, one is where it just ends with the general manager. In another version, we have a grievance committee, and the general manager decides whether to accept the recommendation of the grievance committee or not. Uh, in, to not accept the recommendation of the grievance committee is definitely more difficult, at least politically more difficult for a manager than to simply have the power to decide it and there's no grievance committee involved. You know, like that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty fraught for a general manager because no matter how confidential you try to make a grievance so that nobody knows it's going on, in reality, quite a few people are going to know that it's going on and some of them are going to know what it's about because um, it's pretty hard for employees, you know, whatever you try to say you can't talk about it, we shouldn't be under the illusion that nobody knows, uh, at, le at least in what's going on in a workplace, especially if the employee with the grievance themselves does talk about it or perhaps they talk about it quite a bit before they finally decide to file a grievance. So it's never a secret. Uh, and for the grievance committee to be overridden, those people will know about it, and and they will uh, definitely feel. I um, say that that will that will hurt their relationship with with uh, the general manager. Well, the general manager would have to have some really really strong reasons to override that committee. And so we thought that that was actually a valid option for the model because we thought that only in an extreme situation would a general manager exercise their authority, but. Ultimately, if a board tells a general manager, you know, we want you to, to design a fair and thorough grievance procedure, you know, put it to you, train everybody in how to use it, and, eval and get it evaluated internally and externally, and then the general manager comes up with data that the board accepts as reasonable, you know, that as evidence of complying with the policy, I think that we have to let the general manager use their judgment. I don't think the board should tell a general manager, we want a grievance procedure that's like this, or we want a grievance procedure that's like that. I think we just want to say we want it to be fair and thorough. Perhaps there be some other words the board might choose. I've seen policies such as effective or impartial. These are all good words without getting rid really, really into the detail of exactly how it's going to work. But um, if I were advising a general manager, I would say that although it must, must feel terribly risky to allow anyone else to have the final say, there are uh, advantages in terms of your, uh, I'm going to say, th there's advantages in terms of your relationship with your staff. There, there's a greatness in being willing to be wrong. And that the people can be actually, instead of diminishing respect for a manager, it could increase respect for a manager. Just as we expect, uh, we aren't seeing much evidence of this in lately in history, but we expect, it, we say in the United States, we have a government of laws and not of men. I think that was Jefferson's line. I think we, we operate by laws and not by personal fiat. And so a general manager that abides by that, you know, I think actually wins people's respect. And nevertheless, in spite of the fact that I've gotten over my soapbox and said my opinion on this, I still feel that ultimately the general manager should be the one that decides how they want to adapt the models that we put out there, or, or if they even want to use them at all, in, in which, and how they want their grievance procedure to run. I, and as long as the board is satisfied that the procedure is fair and thorough, with the data that the general manager gives them, I think they need to give the manager the latitude to decide on the particulars of the design of the procedure. That's helpful because it, it um, I think it can be difficult for a board of directors, especially when they've been through the fire, you know, to distance themselves from it and look at a policy, you know, objectively. And that is, I think, also a place where the external monitoring is pretty valuable. And so I'm glad yes. that's part of the model. By having the procedure evaluated afterwards, 
I think that could go a long way. For example, in this co-op you were talking about, the board, board members were not happy that the general manager had the final say. But if that general manager then submitted that grievance to an evaluation by an impartial outsider, and that person pointed out things that were good, things that could be improved about the procedure, that would be really, I think that would reassure the board a great deal. It would. It would. And I think um, it's also helpful and comforting to hear you talk about these as processes that go on through time and particular grievances as um, incidents that will occur in the life of the co-op and be handled, you know, we hope, with increasing skill. Um, but we're not perfect. <laughs> There's no perfect grievance procedure, and just as there are no perfect general managers, there are no perfect employees, and there are no perfect boards. It's such a terrible thing. There are perfect <laughs> webinars, though. <laughs> are there other questions that we should talk about? Did we miss anything? Uh, well, generally related to the uh, grievance project, uh, are there materials available? I know you said it's a work in progress, but is there a place where board members can look at some of those uh, resources? Yes. Can we see the next slide? Yes. The Seabuild Library has uh, many great resources. Uh, first of all, that's where you can find the policy templates uh, for boards. Um, also, the Seabuild Library has the Field Guide series. And these are uh, relatively short, pithy documents that give uh, direction to boards on different aspects of governance. And there is a field guide for boards on staff grievance procedures, or I should say on the relationship of boards to staff grievance procedures. And then finally, the Cooperative Model Grievance Project itself in the library, you will find a, uh, you can download a zip file that's full of documents with many different elements. There's one long background document that gives the whole um, the the process that the task force used and the, the core elements of the model, the four different versions, and then there's flowcharts of the different versions available. There are model policies and a model of a monitoring report and other forms that can be used, and very detailed instructions for a grievance committee. And then uh, one last resource is coming up in Cooperative Grocer, I will be writing an article that will be appearing in the January-February edition. And so the closing thought, I think, is that boards can insist on excellence in staff treatment, and they are best able to achieve that excellence when they avoid getting in the middle. And boards of directors are not alone. There are plenty of resources. And since this is a circumstance that um, co-ops routinely encounter, um, peer support is also uh, available and important. And it's really important that we continue to talk to each other as directors. Um, and use resources like this and test them out, because part of the ongoing conversation um, towards excellence means that we all need to participate. So I think that is concludes our presentation. Carolee, did you have final words of wisdom? <laughs> no, I really like yours. So thank you.